there was this Wall Street Journal reporter that kind of always follows me in my career, and he called me one day when we were early, early days launching Priceline. And he said, what are you doing now? And I told him. And he said, that's stupid. That was his comment. That's a dumb idea. Okay, that would be the equivalent of, uh, you know, Chris Kirkpatrick, a, a good friend of mine, he's the guy that created NSYNC. When they first got the idea, every, do you guys know that every major record label on the planet, pretty much, but certainly in the U.S., passed? They thought it was a dumb idea. Do you know why? It was middle-aged white music executives and, and saying, wait, let me get this straight. There's five of you. You twirl around in sparkly pants, and you can't play instruments. And Chris and Justin are like, yeah, that's our, that's our product. And he was like, that's stupid. Who would listen to that? You know what? 12-year-old girls by the millions will. So why are you asking middle-aged white guys if they like the music? All right? The same thing happens for you. In our Priceline case, the Wall Street Journal reporter said, I think it's a dumb idea. And you know who my customer was? I said, that's nice, but I have zero interest in your opinion. My customer is in, I, I told him not only do my customers not work for the Wall Street Journal, but they've never even read it. Um, that made him feel good. Um, my customer is in Kmart waiting for the blue light special to go off so they can smash old ladies with carts to save a buck fifty. Those people, when we asked them, would you get up at 6 a.m. and fly in an airline you never heard of and connect in St. Louis if you could go to your sister's wedding for a hundred bucks? And they said, damn right I would. Right? So we found those people that would uh, that accept this, and I'll tell you the punchline of the story is kind of funny. At, at the, a year, two years later, after we launched the company and took it public, I get this call from this Wall my, my assistant says, there's a guy from the Wall Street Journal. And he said, oh, I just want to congratulate the team at Priceline. This is a guy who thought it was a stupid product that he would never use, just like the execs where every major le record label passed on NSYNC until a little label at the time, Jive and Zomba, uh, picked it up. But um, the, he said, I just want to congratulate you guys. And I said, on what? And he said, well, your website, we had gone public then and done an IPO. So at that point, this little website company, we didn't own any airplanes like Delta, and we didn't have thousands of employees or offices. We just had a website. Our company at that moment in time was worth $22 billion. He said, your website is worth more than all the airlines in the entire United States combined. We could have bought every airline in the company, in the country, with our stupid idea. And what I remember, I actually said to the guy, I laughed, and he said, why is that funny? I said, you don't remember me, do you? And he said, I've never spoken to you before. I said, oh, yes, you have. <laughs> You're the guy that told me what a stupid idea we were building here. So I want you to do the same thing. Don't listen to the wrong people. If your friends don't listen to your kind of music, quit playing it for them. Go find somebody that listens to this music, that loves it, and you get a false positive or a false negative. If people around you love your music, but they're not the buyer, then it doesn't matter if they love it. The people that you're trying to sell to is a well-defined group, and you better figure out who they are and everything you can know about them, where they shop, where they eat, what other music they listen to, et cetera. So the next step is write a marketing and promotion plan. And I actually liked, uh, you know, we all know this, right? Obviously, we all know the internet and online marketing and iTunes and things like that, but it's bigger than that. Oops, I, I, I guess I have that. All right, I have that coming back up. So when you talk about the marketing plan, I want to give you one other lesson in marketing that I think is really important. We all know that you're going to try to break through the noise on, on sites like iTunes or any kind of online site where you can sell your music. That's not a marketing plan. You'd be amazed how many times people say, well, we're going to get our songs up on iTunes. That's your marketing plan. Your marketing plan is to hope somebody stumbles into you, right? I actually had a guy in our movie company that was sitting in Starbucks one day, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, trying to finance this film. And I said, so you're just hoping somebody wanders into Starbucks and says, hey, did you need some money for a movie? It ain't going to happen. If you're just sitting in Starbucks all day, you're not going to find financing for your film there. Well, likewise, if your plan is to wait for somebody to stumble across your music, it ain't going to work. So I'm going to give you an example of the PR side of it. You'll, you'll tell me, well, Jeff, I don't have money for marketing. Well, you know what? Even if you don't have money, let me give you a PR example. So one of the groups that I had here in Atlanta a few years back, and, and the example I want to give you is PR. Find a way to do something that gets you noticed, even starting in your community. So they didn't have money to go market themselves at the time. So guess what? We were keeping an eye on the world around us, which I just told you guys to do, and there was a story, just very quickly, there was a story here in town of a girl who got hit by a car and severed her spine here in Atlanta her, her, her senior year, and she was out of school for an entire year. They said she'd never walk again. And she actually was able to take one or two steps again. So the next year, she came back and finished senior year. So the big story was she was supposed to die, and then she was supposed to never walk. And she actually made it to lived and graduated. So at graduation, if you remember, they were going to wheel her up there 
It, it, and she was going to get up and take like four steps and actually walk to the guy to get her diploma and because she was never supposed to walk again. And the night before graduation, the school said, we're afraid she'll fall and get hurt so she can't come to graduation. So they didn't let her into the building at all. So my artists, who I had said, go find something to do that costs no money that would get you noticed, they got an idea. They picked up the phone and said, we are going to restage graduation next Saturday with her on stage, and we're going to write a song for her and sing it to her. And they started calling people. They called a, a place like this and got a room donated free. They called radio stations and said, would you promote this? They called f restaurants and said, would you bring some food? Okay? Then they put the word out through Facebook, Twitter, everything that they could, and said, come support this girl. They staged the graduation. It cost them nothing. At the graduation, they stood up here and sang a song that they wrote for her as she walked across the stage, her four steps, to get her diploma off campus from school. There wasn't a dry eye in the house, but you know what there was in the house? About 12 television cameras from every TV station. My phone rang off the hook for two weeks. Who were those girls? Right, because they sang a song. I said, oh, they wrote that song. They performed it. And they said, that was a wonderful thing they did, but can we talk about booking them for one of our events? So they got noticed all over the country. They wound up on CNN. It didn't cost them a dime. They found a way to do something that would get them noticed. I will challenge you guys to think about where is your audience, and is there something you could do in your community that would give you a chance to be on stage and get noticed? I only have two things left here. Write a business plan. And I, I do want to use this quote from Simon. I have uh, worked with a guy before, but I kind of like this. When people say to me, a business plan, I write songs. I'm an artist. And I don't say this, but sometimes I think, and that is why your biggest performance has still been in your shower to date or in your basement. We get that, but it's a business. And if you don't have a plan, if your plan is, I'm going to sit in Starbucks till somebody wanders in and discovers me, it ain't going to happen. Right? And if your plan is, I'll just put it on iTunes and wait until somebody stumbles into it, it isn't going to happen. If your plan is to build a team, if your plan is to do a PR or an event in your community to get noticed, all those things are business plan. You're a startup. How are you launching your business? How are you going to build your team? How are you going to create your product? What product are you going to create? How are you going to find your, your, your customers? your early adopters, your, faint, your crazy customers and your street team kind of people? How are you going to market to them? If the, with the couple of dollars you do have, how are you going to use the internet and market? All these things, you need to think about the business instead of waiting for somebody else to come along and do it for you. You're launching a company. You have a product that has to be developed. You have a market. You have marketing. You have distribution. You have sales. How are you going to take money? Maybe you're just going to get one of those little square things on your phone and slide it, but all that has to be thought out. Right? How are you going to process all this stuff? You're running a business, so sit down and write a plan. One of the things that we got successful in our film company was I come from the business side. So most people just send me a script. But what I would do is my team, we'd write a business plan for the movie. Because the business plan includes how are we going to finance it? How are we going to film it? How are we going to market it? How are we going to distribute it? All those things are really important uh, in the business side. I I'm going to skip this one because I think we covered it enough about about building a customer base, about those concentric circles and finding your most important customer. So the last piece I want to, want to talk about today is about building your team. And I want to tell you a little story. I know that cabin fever thing didn't come out real well, but I want to give you a story about team. When I went to do the first independent, make my first movie, the guy in the middle that's filming my death scene, uh, I just got hit in the head in the camera. I mean with a hammer on that scene before I die. The guy in the middle was my partner in this, a guy named Eli Roth. Eli makes a well, this was our first film that we did together, our first, first horror film. But the first movie either of us had ever made. When I went off to make a movie, just like you going off to launch your music career, everybody said, Jeff, you don't know jack about movies. How are you going to make a movie? You're not a movie guy. You're not an artist. Well, you know what? I'm not planning to act in it, right? Just like I'm not planning to take the mound and pitch. Okay, and I'm also not planning to operate a camera because I don't know how, which means maybe I'm not going to lead the league in home runs. But I can play shortstop, and no ball is going to get to this infield. There is some position on a team that every one of us can play. You know what mine is? I know how to finance things, and I know how to market them and distribute them. So when we got together, Eli, who went to film school, says, I don't know anything about business or finance, but I know how to direct actors and I know how to operate cameras. So what we did was, instead of artists saying, business guys, lawyers, all those people, who needs them? What we all said was, neither of us can do this alone. 
but together we can probably do something really amazing. And likewise, for me, as a business guy, disrespecting an artist, never going to happen. Right? The artist is the product in the middle of all this. So I'm going to tell you the story. We decided to make our first movie here, this scary film. And while we were doing it, in the early days, we were out on the set shooting the film. And <clears throat> I did not know, as, an, as somebody that's not an artist, that when you watch a movie, it happens in order. When you film a movie, you don't film it in that order. So if the opening scene of your movie takes place with the, the four of us are sitting in a restaurant chatting, and then the closing scene of the movie, he comes in and shoots us all, okay, in the same restaurant. If the way you film it is we film all the restaurant scenes. So I'm standing on the set watching us chat in, a con in the restaurant, and two hours later he comes in and kills everybody. And I was like, Eli, that seems like a really short movie, okay? <laughs> and he's like, Jeff, you don't shoot them that way, right? And I, so I stood there, I said, I don't understand the art part. I'm standing in the music studio and saying, I don't understand what you guys do. And Eli said to me, you're right, Jeff, you don't understand. He said, you see that over there? I said, the trailer? And he said, yeah, there's coffee in there. Go wait in the trailer. OK? So I had to walk, tail between my legs, through everybody laughing at me, and go to the trailer and have coffee, because I don't understand what the artists are doing. Now I'm going to take you to later that year. We're at the Toronto Film Festival. I've got everybody from Harvey Weinstein and Miramax and Sony. We've got a bidding war going on for this movie. Okay, I've got my finance guy on my right and my lawyer on my left, and contracts everywhere. I am deep in the middle of negotiating what turned out to be the biggest independent film deal in the entire country that year that we did for this film. Um, while I'm sitting doing that, Eli wanders in. And he looks over my shoulder at all these contracts and financial legal documents and financial forms. And he goes, dude, I don't understand any of this stuff. And I was like, this is perfect. I said, Eli, look, what is that across the street? And he goes, what, the coffee shop? And I said, yeah, why don't you go wait there, <laughs> OK? So here is the point. I could have never created the product, and he could have never financed and sold it. We are a team, and we respect our differences. Together, we made this little movie. I spent $1.4 million. That's all we spent as a production team to make this movie, and worldwide, it's grossed almost $100 million. So maybe it was funny, but we laughed all the way to the bank. Um, summarizing. Uh, Eli would have not thought, you know, as an artist, who you don't want to hang around with some business guy like Jeff, and I might, as most of my business friends were like, these artists, they're all flaky, and I don't want to hang around with them. That's why somebody told me 97% of all independent films will never see the light of day. It's just like all the songs produced in basements and people singing in the shower are not going to be on the radio when you get in your car. There's a reason why, because they didn't do this. They didn't get over themselves enough to say, I need, we need each other, we are a team, and I need people who I don't necessarily even love hanging out with, but I need them with me because together we make a winning product. So let me summarize here. Do not forget that no matter what you are, you're an entrepreneur. And study entrepreneurship and find out what entrepreneurs do and find out how they do that because you're one. Okay, And you're not just building a song, launching a song, you're launching a business. You have to have a layer wrapped around you, like Britney Spears does, of all the people that could actually make you successful in the world, because you can't do it without them. And last, the most important thing is, you've got to find a team. And you should start, if you don't already, right here with the people in this room. Every one of you should take the time to walk up to everybody else in this room and say, tell me what you do and tell me how we could work together. You gotta build a team, it's not easy to do, but it's so, so important. I always take the time to ask people. My first question is always, tell me about you and what you do uh, to see where our paths could cross. So, Jack, I don't know if we have time for any questions. <clears throat> Otherwise, we can do them at the break or at lunch because I'll, I'll hang around as well. And that's my contact info. Uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. We can, we can take one or two quick ones. I don't know, I'm not on the panels. Well, I don't know, I, I don't know if you want to avoid it. Some people start the other direction. They start by creating a career on the, on the short end, on the smaller interest groups and customer groups, and then spread outwards. That was kind of the concentric circles. What happens is everybody's battling for, this small, for these core customers. And your customers, like I said, if everybody was battling for the high-end retail customer in Nordstrom's because they got the most money, and what we did in Priceline was say, all right, everybody's trying to get this, these people with the money that are in Nordstrom's. We're going to go over to Kmart. There's less of them. Sorry, let me rephrase that. They have less money, but there's millions of them. So you might start smaller and build yourself up at the other end of the long tail, per se. 
Um, and, and we kind of did it that way. Why, why go where the, where the crowd is? In fact, to give you an, an example, again, in the Priceline model, when the business got, the airline business got really busy here and everybody would call and say, how are you going to compete to sell airline tickets with Hotwired and Travelocity and Expedia? You know what we said publicly? Oh, that's really hard. You know what we did quietly? We went to Asia and just sold the hell out of the Asian product before anyone else went there. Then we went to Europe and sold the product there. We sold the hotel product. There's always a space where everybody else isn't standing, so why fight them? There's somebody over here, a market you could go crush that market, and then move, and everyone will turn and say, what's all that crowd forming over there? It's not the conventional way, but I think it's the smart way. One more question? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so not just for the lawyers, but for every member of the team, never, here's an important thing, never, it's never personal. It's always business. So everything you do to build a good business should be business objectives. You're not, you're not looking at her, because she's an attorney, and saying, let's figure out what she should do. What you're doing is saying, for me to be successful, the following things have to happen. I gotta book four shows of audio, I'm making this up. I wanna book four shows this year where I'm performing for at least 5,000 people. Okay, so let's say I wrote that on the board as a goal. Now what you do is you don't look at the people and say, well, tell me what you're going to do for me. What you do is you point at the goal and say, I got to book four shows where there's at least 5,000 people. How can you help me do that? Everything should drive from business. So she's going to say to you, in order to book those shows, they're going to present you with contracts and writers and documents that you've never even read before. I can prepare all those for you. You say, great, you're in. Okay, she's going to tell you, I actually know some, some promoters and I know some people in the tour business and I think I can book at least two venues that have 5,000 people and we say, all right, you're on the team. Everything is driven by business objectives. So what I did to answer your question was I wrote down what I was trying to do and I let lawyers, accountants, marketers, whoever, I said, how can you help me achieve this? And if people had a good answer, I said, great, you're on the team. Never make it personal and don't find things for people to do because it's a friend of yours. You're, you're, that's the kiss of death, is dragging all your friends along and just saying, let me just find something for you to do. And instead, show them what you're trying to do, and if they can't tell you how they can help you do it, they're your friend. You can hang out with them after work, but they can't be on the team. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>